Welcome to Enduring the Badge Podcast. I'm your host, Jerry Dean Lund, and today my very special guest is Eric Petrowski. We're going to dive down into Eric's military career and see how that propelled him for a successful career outside the military and how he's achieving that with his family. Let's jump right into this episode with Eric. Hey, how you doing, Eric? I'm well. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Glad to have you in the studio here. It's been a while. It's taken me a second to get things <laughs> hooked back up, right? And uh, Eric's from in and out of town. This is he's my son-in-law, and uh, we're gonna today we're gonna talk about his military service, kind of what that prepared him for, and uh, where he's at now. So introduce yourself, Eric. Yeah. So as as Jerry said, my name is Eric Petrowski. Uh, I did uh, a short stint in the army, really only three years, uh, as a UAS operator and standardization uh, instructor. Um, from there, I've been in the government contracting world really since I got out in 2006, so a little over 14 years now. Um, a lot of ups and downs, moving all over the country currently, uh, as he said, uh, living in Huntsville, Alabama, and, and up here visiting for the holidays, so it's nice to be here. Yeah, it's nice to have you here. Um, got a little snow here, and so, and I'm just recovering from COVID, so <laughs> I'm glad to have you here and be back. So you're in the military for just... Three years. How come just three years? Uh, ignorance more than anything. I think uh, in, I joined in 2003 as a, um, I, I guess the best way to put it, because I didn't, I didn't see a lot of other options. I had, had gone to college and that didn't work out. I wasn't mentally and, and mature enough yet ready to be in college on my own and, and have that kind of responsibility to go to class and not just do whatever I wanted. Um, so college didn't work out my first try, uh, was working odds and ends jobs, construction mostly, and, you know, kind of wanted better for myself. And, and my little sister actually talked me into joining the army. She joined at the same time. Um, we both joined in 2003. She left for basic a little bit before I did. Um, but yeah, in 2003, I went early in the year and took my ASVAP and, and scored well enough that I got to pick my job in the army, which was nice. Um. Did a little bit of research as to, you know, not necessarily wanting to be a, a ground and pound guy on the front lines. That didn't really appeal to me. Um, but the Army offers such a wide variety of, of real world job experience and, and just training that you can't get anywhere else. So did my research and, and landed on drones, UA, UAVs at the time, now UAS. Um, at the time, it was military intelligence. Now it's aviation it's undergone so many changes in the last 17 years. It's You could have a whole podcast just on that, really. <laughs> um, but, you know, landed on that and, and happened to be good at it. I guess to answer your question, three years, because that's when my first contract expired. And I already had some job offers outside of the Army. Um, I was in my first marriage at the time, had two young kids, was just coming off of almost 18 months in Iraq. And didn't want that to be my life. Didn't, didn't want to be there constantly and not see anything. Um, so I didn't know what I didn't know. Got out, you know, the, the money I thought was, was great on the other side, not taking into account the benefits because I wasn't smart enough to take into account the benefits that the army offered. And, you know, if I, if I had to do it over again, I probably wouldn't, but landed me in a good spot. So, so three years in and, uh, you ended up in Iraq anywhere else. No, no, I did it. I, I spent almost to the week my first year in training um, between basic training and then AIT, which, which is your, your job training um, for, for my military occupational specialty, MOS. That was, it was scheduled to be a, I think, 30 week class, but I ended up there for 45 weeks. Um, just because of the backlog, um, we had a couple incidents, crashes with the plane, so we weren't flying. So the training kind of came to a grinding halt. So we were there for a lot longer than expected, but, um, it's one of the longer MOS schools, AITs in the army to begin with, just because of how specialized the field is. But, um, so between that and then, then from AIT, I went to Fort Bragg to go to airborne school, jumped out of airplanes for three weeks. Uh, and then finally, a year after I joined the Army, got to my duty station uh, at Fort Stewart, Georgia. And so then they shortly shipped you off to Iraq after that. And then what what did you do in Iraq? Yeah, pretty quick. We uh, 
I got to, when did I get to Stewart? I got to Stewart in early May. Um, for the first three or four months, we didn't do anything really. I mean, guard duty and, and random army stuff went to the range to, to shoot. And we did ruck marches because we didn't have equipment yet. The, the MOS or the, the, the field that I was in, not all of the fielded units had equipment yet. So we didn't have planes. We didn't have GCSs to fly with. So we were literally just sort of sitting around trying to figure out stuff to do. Um, so they found stuff for you to do. They yeah. don't want you sitting around, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Getting climatized, right? We, Doing ruck we marches to, in the Yeah, in the, we, we, we went to the same. range a lot. We went to the ruck march. We went to the NBC chamber. You know, we did a lot of the, the garrison army stuff, training. Uh, and then we got our equipment in July. No, August. We got our equipment in August. Uh, went through another nine-week training where uh, a, a team of people which is really what I ended up doing when I got out of the Army. I was one of the people that went and trained. But a team of people came in and taught all of us individuals who knew, you know, the basics of, of how to fly this thing and, and taught us how to do it as a team, as a cohesive unit of 27 people. Um, so that took nine weeks. And then from there, we went on block leave for Christmas, and then we deployed. Um, oh, yeah. And what kind of uh, miss missions did you fly in Iraq? Or, or what can you talk about, I guess? Um, I mean, basic. So so what we do, it's, it's ISR, which is Intelligence, Surveillance, and, and Reconnaissance. Um, a lot of just flying up and down a road. Hey, fly up and down this road for the next eight hours and see if you see anything. Um several days, several weeks, we didn't see anything. You know, we might might see something we thought was suspicious and it was nothing more than a person on the side of the road changing a tire. Okay. Um, <laughs> but then other times we saw stuff that, you know, ended up leading to us finding IEDs that were being in place. And, and unfortunately, sometimes we'd be out in front of convoys and we missed IEDs that were being in place. And, you know, that, that was the, the bad part of the job, I guess. Yeah. That, how did that affect you, missing something like that or feeling like you missed something like that because i mean they're, they're very they were very good at their job and still are of you know doing that type of tactics yeah it was i guess it's, you know it, it's hard to see but at the same time um i i guess knowing that the people on the ground the the whoever was in that convoy for us also knows that that's a risk i mean there's there's risk associated with every mission from from the missions that we're flying on the aviation side to the missions they're doing on the convoy side and the, and the ground and pound side so um it was never fun but i i think for me i'm not as affected as some other people that that i know um i, I have some some close friends who have, have some pretty serious ptsd um from the uas world which you know we were never on the front line, shooting weapons, doing that sort of stuff. But we got to see some things that, that, you know, people shouldn't have to. Um, so all through running the operations of intelligence within drones, being able to see, can you hear, um, with a, well, we, we would have direct radio communications with the unit we were supporting most of the time, not always. Um, there were times where we were only plugged into, um, the, the given talk. So we might only be talking to, you know, the battle commander and, and some of the, the analyst folks in the, in the talk. There were other times where we had direct lines of communications down to the convoy we were in support of or the raid we were in support of. So just depended on the mission. Yeah. How many missions would would you say if, where you were flying missions 24 hours a day? Oh, yeah. Or? yeah I, I, countless. Um, I, I, for the most part, did not spend most of my time flying you know, six, eight hours at a time doing missions. Um, I ran our launch and recovery site. We worked on what's, what's called a hub and spoke con op where we had one launch recovery site that supported seven units. So we had all the planes and all the maintenance took place at, at my site. But in terms of the missions, really all we would do was launch, fly it forward to the the AO and we would hand it off to the mission site. They would fly the mission when they were done. We would take it back and land. Um, so I spent the majority of my time doing that, which is probably part of the reason why I don't have, you know, as, as much effect from the past as, as some of the people that I worked with. But, um, 
Are they really just flying around? It, like, what's it look like for those people that are flying those missions? Are they in Iraq? Are they in the U.S. flying yeah, the missions? For, for the Shadow Shadow 200, which is what I flew, though, those people are there. There's no, There was no remote capability. Um, really not even beyond line of sight. If we, if we had to go farther than our line of sight would allow, we would, we would have to sort of go from one station to another and perform multiple handoffs to get that far out. Um, but no, nobody likes sitting back here in the States and flying. The, so the, I'm assuming this technology that you learned, you know, help you prefer where you're at today, but has technology for those drones just exponentially gotten better and better as time gone on? Yes and no. I mean, it, it's, in terms of the the size, I mean, everybody's got a drone today. I, I'm <laughs> yeah, sure you have yeah. one or two in this house. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, w when I started in 2003, that was not the case. Um, line of sight technology, you know, when, when we talk about a, a personal drone, for the most part, you can fly it as far as your remote control can can keep communication with with the drone that you're doing and and for the most part that's what i did as well much bigger remote control and that it's you know an entire shelter on the back of a humvee and my antenna is essentially a satellite kit that sits outside so i mean we could go the 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 published range is like 125 kilometers depending on atmospheric conditions and and mountains and where you are get a little bit more or a little bit less than that but i mean 125 kilometers is it's a good haul, especially yeah. for a plane that's only flying, you know, six to nine hours, depending on the package that's on it anyway. When you're spending almost half that time transiting back and forth to go 125 kilometers in and out, you know, you're you're not doing much mission-wise. Most of our missions stayed within 50 to 60 kilometers of um, whatever talk we were supporting. So you're doing these back of Humvees, and sometimes were they being like bases, or you're just doing them generally like remotely from like, what you call that, in the field? Yeah, so our, our our launch recovery site was was obviously at an airfield uh, in Iraq, and we were backed up on one of the taxiways. One of the taxiways was closed off, and it was nothing but us. So we had our shelter set up for the launch recovery site. Um, our normal shelter, if you will, is a, a a box that's retrofitted onto the back of a Humvee. It's got two crew stations: one for the person flying, one for the person operating the camera. Um, and then everything plugs into the side. Your antenna plugs into the side. Uh, your your radios are right there in the shelter with you to use. Um, we also have what is called the, the portable GCS, which is really just a, a standalone box, if you will. And the newer ones now have two fold-out screens. Um, the antenna is smaller, so you don't have as good of range. But for launch recovery operations are great because you can set that up. You know, you could set it up on this desk and put it in a little shack, and you don't need the whole Humvee, um, and you can just launch and recover right out of that. You get a little portable radio set up and, and go that route or use handheld radios. We did that a lot, too. So so military is quite a bit different from the personal drones that we have today, or are they, the personal drones really getting so good that, you know, that they kind of compare with the military in some ways? Yeah, it, it it depends on the on the scale you're talking about, right? Because the military has everything from drones that are the size of 747s to, you know, sort of the one everybody sees and the one that gets on TV a lot is is Reaper or Predator, which is also a pretty big bird. I mean, it's it's as big as a a small regional jet that you would fly on. You know, if you were flying from from here to Vegas, you get on a little RJ similar in size really Those they, are don't, they don't longer. look like it they look i mean in the movies they look like they're yeah fairly small but that's that's, that's, that's oh, over that's a 20 a, foot wingspan yeah so it's pretty big it's a pretty big bird the shadow that i flew you know wingspan of of it started off as 16 feet and then as as different packages got put on it and increased endurance bigger fuel cells and everything it went up to i think 21 feet so i mean you're again you're not talking about small planes um wingspan wise as big as a Cessna but yeah. the the height profile is different drastically the shadow's not very tall it's only not even three feet tall so that's where the big difference comes into play but with that you know they can carry anywhere from a 35 to 75 pound payload ball depending on the platform you're talking about so that's something where a personal drone 
like don't get me wrong they have good <laughs> small high definition cameras in a lot of personal drones that are out of this world and the army uses some of those at this point you know they didn't back then but they do now especially some of the special ops guys they handheld drones are very much a part of the army at this point but in terms of the the larger scale stuff there's still no personal stuff on the market i mean you just you can't afford a million dollar payload in the army can yeah that's what yeah. it boils down to what about amazon i mean what <laughs> <laughs> they're gonna start be like right they're trying to deliver by drones here shortly well multiple places are they yeah they're getting their their paperwork filed to to do those type of things in in testing You've seen that, that that's not going to be the type of drones that they use. They're going to be using more of the what we see in the civilian side of things for delivery. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you're not you're, they're not going to use a, a a runway based or even even a even a vertical takeoff and lift capability. But they're not going to use something that has you know a million dollar payload on it. They're not going to use something that has. A, so they're not going to drop stuff by little parachutes out of <laughs> no, <laughs> above maybe, your house and maybe, land on there. <laughs> maybe just depends on what you buy, how fragile right. it is. So something something fragile, they might need to <laughs> drop, bring it down right to the porch. Something not fragile, they might. I mean, who knows? The army pushes equipment out of airplanes with parachutes, so right, might, might right. as well. Yeah, that'd that'd be tricky in the in the climate conditions around here with the wind and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. Utah's nothing if not variable right but it's pretty <laughs> yeah so the the drone technology that you learned in the military in those three years of service you decided to to leave the military because the money looked to to better on the outside yeah the money and and again my my lack of knowledge you know i i, I thought to myself well i don't want to deploy as much um the money i thought was better you know, by the time I did all the math, when I got out, I really took a little bit of a pay cut. It was it was really similar, but by the time I was, you know, paying for my own insurance and not getting an extra stipend for housing and food and everything else, the the money I got out for was not worth getting out for. Um, but the job I got out for was great. So, yeah. So what what did uh, so you left the military and the did the job was a very similar to what you were doing in the military? It was a, it was the same essentially. Um, I mentioned people came to Fort Stewart to train us. Um, I started being on that team. I, I started going out and training soldiers, um, different units, how to fly that that drone, um, taking them from the ground up, being, you know, either people that transferred in from other units or people that were straight out of the schoolhouse, uh, NCOs and leadership that, that may or may not have had any drone experience, let alone even, in, in a lot of cases, even any aviation experience. And we took those units and, and, you know, showed them how to operate. And where did you where did you do that at? Did you go all over the all over the country and yep. deploy outside of the country? Well, <laughs> so we the company I worked for provided the training at all of the army sites. Um, some people were lucky enough to get to go to Germany and Guam and and some of the cooler places that had shadow units. Uh, I was not one of those guys. I spent a lot of time at Fort Hood and Fort Riley, um, so yeah. But I, I was I was based out of Fort. <laughs> you missed Pachuca. the glamorous ones, yeah. huh? I, I was based out of Arizona, um, so I, I did my training in Arizona when I was in the Army, and then when I got out, the job I took that company was based out of Arizona as well. We had the flight line right next to the schoolhouse, so I, I went back to Sierra Vista, um, lived there, and, and traveled sometimes as much as forty weeks out of the year, so. Um, to different bases about depending on the event some were, were short reset events that were only three weeks long but the majority were nine week events um, a couple of longer ones we transitioned both the marines and the navy over to shadow from their older platform which was pioneer so they had a lot of the drone experience but we're getting an updated platform um, but we transitioned them and those were about 12 week events so as little as three years of army training and prepared you to go out and train the people that you basically you you left right in the army yeah and then how, how'd your career uh, progress from there um you know typical corporate ladder if you will i mean it, the the job had upward mobility in that you know you you started off as one of the team members who would go out and train and then we had people who would lead the events, you know, the small teams. We traveled in teams of six usually. 
Um, so there would be one person who led those events. That was sort of the next step. Uh, and then from there, you could go up and manage, you know, and, and be a, a manager of people um, to the point now where I, I got into project management in, oh, 2014, I think, was when I first started doing um, control account management, which was, you know, s small individual tasks, managing the schedules and the budgets for those. Um, which has progressed all the way now to being a, a program manager on a $500 million army contract. Yeah. <laughs> and in that meantime, well, I mean, you, 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 you initially went to college, but now during all this uh, upskill movement in your career, you continued to go to college. I did. I, I, early when I got out, uh, I finished my associate's degree. Our, our training in the army at Fort Huachuca gave us a bunch of college credits through one of the local community colleges. Um, when I find, when I got out, I was finally smart enough to take advantage of that. I went back when I lived back in Arizona, re-enrolled, uh, and I, I had to take, I think, four or five classes to finish my associate's degree. So I finished that up, um, waited a couple more years until it, until it really looked like I was getting to the point where upward mobility was going to require a bachelor's degree. Uh, finished my bachelor's degree, and then recently I did my PMP certification. I still need to go back and finish my master's one of these years because I'm at that point now. Oh, yeah. That's a lot. Pretty sure I'm never going to get my master's in anything. Maybe just life skills. I, I, <laughs> I, I don't want to get my master's. <laughs> I don't want to go back to school, but I'll need to here soon. Yeah, how is it doing this upskill movement, going to college and everything, you know, and having a family? Um, stressful at times. I mean, it's you find time for the things that you need to do right and and when i'm going to school i manage it you know I'm, i might get two or three hours less of sleep a night um, but i find time i might work out a little less when i'm going to school or just when i'm being lazy but um, I, i've never had an issue like Haley, my wife would would tell you I'm a chronic procrastinator, but at the same time I don't, I don't ever miss deadlines. I'm never late for something, so I might wait until the last minute to do it, but it's going to get done. Yeah, uh, and that's it's kind of the way it's always been with school. My my kids going to online school for coronavirus now and and struggling with online school, and I've done two degrees and, and an entire two other certificate programs now, so it's online school works out better for me. Yeah, I think as adults, we're, we're a little more uh, able to make that adjustment in our lives, yeah. you know, multitask and in our lives to, to do that. But for kids to go online, yeah, they're definitely struggling in a, a lot of different ways. Yeah, high school's so more... They, they procrastinate and don't get things done. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and I see it now, you know, it, it's hard to... I, I know I didn't see it when I was in high school, and it's hard... You know, I have, I have three older kids in high school, and, and for all of them this year, when they've been online, it, it's been a struggle. But high school is more about teaching you how to interact and teaching you how to be a person, um, you know, giving you those, those like you said, life skills, whereas college is really more about the academic portion. There, There's a lot of interaction, and there's a lot of great things about the social aspect of college, but when it comes to the the, the nitty-gritty of it, it's learning what you have to learn to get that piece of paper that says, hey, I have a degree. Whereas in high school, yeah, the diploma is the end goal, but almost anybody can get that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's going to be interesting to see how long this continues. Hopefully not yeah. very long because it, it's funny here in Utah, people, uh, well, a few kids from different schools are actually protesting to get back into school just so they could learn because they're failing so miserably, you know, doing online and, some some places in the country are just strictly online. Here it's either online or some kind of hybrid form, you know, of that and stuff like that. But I was just thinking about that, you know, when you're talking about high school and college and stuff like that, you really, I think you make the transition of, right, what you really want to learn. You're going to college because you want to learn. Or, well, I mean, if you're ready, right? If you're ready. You said you weren't, that's, that's you why said you, you weren't ready. That is, why, <laughs> that is why you should go to college. Yeah. <laughs> Especially right out of high school, it's not why a lot of people go to college. A lot of people go to college because they're pressured to or they think they have to or, or whatever. But the reality is you should go to college to pursue a degree that you want to or pursue a career path that you want to. Um, 
you know, and that and and especially nowadays with with the cost of college, it's it's not always the best answer. I mean, I, it, there's so many things that you can do now. There's so many trades that you can learn without going to a real four year brick and mortar school that you know you end up with with a great career just the same and yeah. and the army is a perfect example i mean we we mentioned how much college i've done since i got out of the army and the reality is i got paid to do that college i didn't pay for it i got paid to do it and yeah the university's got their money but i got you know the the benefits of being a veteran on top of that which was you know looking back on it the on, on the job training and the benefits coming out of the army were it was the best decision i ever made so, so looking back on it, and w- would you recommend that for your kids or to do that in the in the future when they graduate high school? Would you encourage them to look at you know doing absolutely some army or something yeah army like that? air force you know yeah. some some one one of the services the the as long as you do it again as long as you have some interest in it you know you're, yourself as a firefighter it's not a job that you can get into and not have a passion for. It's not something you can go do and be half in. The Army's not for everyone, you know, and, and the same can be said about all the services, I'm sure. But if if it is something that you have any interest in or something you have any capacity to do, the benefits when you get out, even if it is just the fact that your school will be paid for, um, you have benefits, whether it be, you know, j- just as simple as, hey, I get the military discount when I shop for things, or... I don't have to put a down payment on a house when I buy one. You know, there there's VA benefits out there for everything. Yeah, so um, a lot more than just going to school. There's a lot other benefits. Oh yeah, yeah. That it, you could take in. Yeah, I mean, they're to the point now. There's certain websites you can look at. Um, what what was the one I saw yesterday? Vettix dot org, where where people donate tickets to events and they're given away to veterans. Um, you know, simple things like that are, are are afforded to people who who serve. Whereas, if you're not, it's just not. And yeah, why do you, why do you think there are less people serving? I think there's more pressure on people. Yeah, I, I think there's a there's a difference generationally from from the way your generation parented to the way my generation parents. That's and, for sure. <laughs> and my generation, you know, we were we were kind of latchkey kids yeah. uh, for the most part. And it, it was, we found our way and most of us had the freedom to become our own person. And I think a lot of the people in my generation either had some resentment towards that or whatever it is, but we've overcorrected and parents my age who you know now are starting to have those teenagers I, I mean my oldest son's 17 he'll be 18 in april and i have friends with kids that are already in their 20s and it's just the helicopter parent and oh you have to do this and oh my god you have to go to college you have to do this you have to do that and less and less of them even even give their kids the option to think about the military it's between everything you see on the news and the divisiveness of of this country kids not really knowing which side of that fence they're on and then having that uncertainty, why would they want to go potentially put their life on the line for something they don't even know how they feel about, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it is totally different. Um, one of the things I noticed with this even younger generation, uh, we have kids in elementary and, uh, middle school that, uh, now there's, they've identified themselves as Republicans and Democrats. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure when I went to school, I never like had that thought cross my mind, but they're like, and then they I'm, get into arguments I, about I'm, it. Like, I'm 39 years old and I can barely tell you the difference between the two. Like, I, I have to check every once in a while. <laughs> I just think it's so interesting that that age group is uh, picked up on that. And, I, and I'm guessing it's just because of the influence of, of parenting now and social media and stuff like that. They're really just it's, it's driving this. Media. Yeah driving this divisiveness even you know there, with the kids. there is the the one, one of the the mantras of the company i work for now is is make the world smaller and safer the world's never been smaller the the access to info i mean right now we're sitting here recording a podcast that's going to be broadcasted on the internet and anybody in any country can listen to it yeah for the most part when you were a kid that's 
that was undreamable. Right, right. And when I was a kid, I didn't have the internet until I was in high school. And even then it was dial up on the phone line <laughs> and, you know, your mom and your dad are like, hey, I've got to make a phone call, get off the internet. Yeah. Now, everybody walking around has the entire internet literally at the tip of their fingers. And there's websites that do nothing but connect people from opposite ends of the globe. People who, you know, to your point, there's probably middle school kids out there who would say some of their best friends in the world are people they've never met. Yeah. Whether it be through social media or as simple as playing video games. My my 15-year-old son, you know, I, I give him crap. Why don't you ever go out and do anything? I talk to him, play with my friends every day online. Like, <laughs> He has times. We're all getting online at 1500 to play Call of Duty. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's hard, hard for me to understand. But luckily, he still does sports and all these other things and gets him out and stuff like that and active. Because and, you can't learn the same type of interactions, you know, through... So, social through cues and and true social interaction are are so lacking. Like, the the used car salesman, if you will, the, the person who can talk to anybody and, and, and adapt to any conversation or, or input themselves in any situation to be comfortable is, is quickly going by the wayside. Kids these days are only comfortable in what they're comfortable in. That, that's the only conversation they want to have. And trying to get them to come out of that shell and understand that that the world is not an echo chamber is so hard. Like it, there, there's so many kids out there who the first time they hear the word no and the first time they, uh, they, they truly feel rejection in their life might very well be a college application. And that's unfortunate, yeah. in my opinion anyway. Yeah. You think the military uh, takes care of a lot of that, the social interactions? and Yes and no. It, it definitely, again, it's, it's if you're the kind of person who, who can be in that environment, I mean, it was it was probably the most fun three years I've ever had in my life, and and in in particular, the three weeks I spent in jump in in jump school, literally probably the the most fun I've ever had in a three week period in my life. But you know, getting woken up at four o'clock in the morning to run five miles and then go jump out of airplanes all day is kind of fun to me. I, yeah, I, it's not the case <laughs> for everyone. Yeah. I, I, well, I mean, you're forced to interact, right? You can't. You can't be. Can yeah. you be a social inter, like introvert and be in the military? You can. You can. And there, are, there are definitely people who are are introverts that are that serve. I mean, it, it's you get all walks of life because you have to have all levels of people in the army. Every everything from a, a general commanding an entire base down to you know on the officer side, you know down stair stair step all the way down to the lieutenant who you know, oversees half of a platoon or a certain aspect of a platoon that might only be 18 to 20 people, and they're only overseeing one portion of that. You know, to on the enlisted side where you have, you know, sar again, sergeant majors serving right alongside those generals who, who oversee entire bases and in some cases entire divisions, down to, you know, squad leader NCOs, junior NCOs that have a team of four or five people. But even below that, you have those four or five people who they have their job to do and that's what they're focused on, and, and that is what it is. You can be an introvert, but you have to be able to function as part <laughs> still, of a team. Still communicate. Yeah, well, yeah, you, yeah. as long as you can function as part of a team. Like, you don't have to go out and have beers with people. You don't have to go to a barbecue on the weekend by any means. You can, and that the Army's great for that. Um, but if you're the person who sits in your room and plays video games all weekend, that person can definitely still thrive in the Army. Yeah. That's it's interesting to me. I mean, I've never served in the in anything like that, but uh, I know just like you know, in the fire service, it's or police and stuff like that. It's, there are introverts, but it's it's hard. It's hard, especially in the fire service. You you, you live with people, you know, twenty four, forty eight, and even longer stints at a time. So I, you can't really be a introvert. Yeah. I mean, or the, otherwise they'll pick at you. Well, yeah, drive I, you crazy. I, there. I, <laughs> There is that. You got to have, if you, if you are that introvert in the army, you probably have to have a little bit thicker skin. I mean, everyone in the army kind of have to, has to have thick skin. It, it, even today, it's a, it's a kinder, gentler army, I would say, than it was even when I joined. And I can't imagine what it was like for my grandfather, who was a Marine in, in Vietnam. Yeah. I can't imagine the, the, the hardness of those individuals. Um, but, you know, you got to have thick skin. Can you have a great military career and you know, and a 
great family at the same time. Absolutely. Uh, and in fact, I think, I, I think the army does a great job and I, and I shouldn't just say the army, the armed forces do a great job of promoting family life and, and making it viable even in times where, you know, where you might deploy a lot. Um, different benefits that are afforded to families, um, the the housing that's afforded to families, just the the groups on on base that support families while people are deployed, every, everything about it. I think I think having a family is it, it might be hard to see being young and having a family in the army, but it, looking back on it now and and knowing some people who are still in the army who I served with and and what it's afforded their families, yeah, I think it's absolutely not just possible, but I think the army encourages it. So the hardest parts of being probably would be deployed without being able to take your family, those long stints and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, and, and to the point of technology, even that has become easier and easier because people can FaceTime with their families every night at this point. You know, everyone, there's, there's no reason why you wouldn't take an iPad and, and probably have the internet in your, in your room or in your tent at your deployed location. Like the, the technology has even made that portion of it. When when I was deployed, I had phone cards, and we had we had trailers set <laughs> I remember up. Remember those phone cards? <laughs> we had we had trailers set up with like twenty phones in them, and there'd be a line of people outside waiting, and somebody would come out, and the next person would go in, and they'd sit down, and they'd call, you know, however many people you were going to call. And there were several several times where I'd get off a twelve hour shift, and I'd go and I'd call call home and you know, talk to my wife and my kids and call my mom and my dad and be on the phone for three or four more hours and then finally get back to my room after that. Today, you just go FaceTime. You yep. go back to your room, you grab your iPad, and you FaceTime with whoever you want to, and you can do it from the comfort of your bed. Uh, and not only is it, you know, you can do that from the comfort of your bed, but you think just having that, uh, being able to see the person on the other side and stuff like that eases some of the anxiety of those that are deployed. Yeah, and probably on both sides. Probably, I yeah, probably. I mean, I'm I'm not a big FaceTime guy. Um, yeah, me neither. Personally, yeah, and just just not something I. But I do it. I do it from time to time. You know, and I I do still travel some for work, and and coming up here more, I'm probably going to travel more for work, and and I'm sure we will use video chat more often than I probably have in the past. But having little kids and and being able to see them, especially, is it, it helps with everything. You know, the the idea of having a baby while you're overseas and missing it crawl for the first time. Well, now you don't have to miss it. It can get videotaped. It can get emailed to you. You can literally sit there and watch it on FaceTime. Yeah. So it definitely makes those things easier. Yeah. Just the same thing, adapt and overcome, mm -hmm. you know, what, uh, moving forward in your life, where do you see yourself down the road? Playing golf. <laughs> um, yeah. Ideally. <laughs> Professionally? But, yeah. No, 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 no. That's too much stress. Buy, buying my wife a farm that happens to be on a golf course. <laughs> that's, that's a dream. Um, no, I mean, I have, I have an opportunity here in, in the, in the short term to take on a little bit more responsibility. Um, like I said, I'll probably within the next five years, I'm, I'm sure I will finish my master's degree. Um, and then who knows, probably a director level position, hopefully within the company I'm currently in. Um, and, and from there, who knows, but yeah. Just keep climbing the corporate ladder. Yeah, is, kind of. And fulfilling your wife's farm needs. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Let her have all the dogs and the animals she wants. And, you know, at, at some point, I, I, I see the opportunity I have right now and the, the little bit of additional travel that it will be. The boys are still young. The, the teenagers are almost out of high school. So it's sort of a, a, a lull point, you know, when... when the two younger boys get to be uh, to the age where they're they're really involved in things, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13, whatever. I'll want to be home more because I'll want to be at those events and then doing those things with them. Um, luckily at, at five and three or four and three, <laughs> yeah. while they have interests, if, you know, if I miss a t-ball game, it's not going to be the end of the world. Yeah. Could be to them. It could be. But... The nice thing is I'm, I'm not going to travel for 18 months at a time, so I might miss one, but I won't miss them all. Yeah, that's good. What uh, impact do you want to leave in the world? Um, really, more than anything, just 
raise kids that that aren't a debt on society. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd like, I think every parent would like for their kid to have it a little bit better than they had it. Um, that's not always easy. You know, I, I'm relatively successful in, in, in certain aspects at least. Um, but just, just having kids that aren't afraid to be themselves and, and raising them to understand that what they want to do is possible. Um, and then giving them the opportunity to make that happen, not having them be stuck in something because they have to be, not having them be, you know, working on the farm because that's their only option. Yeah. So did you, do you feel like your parents could have done a better job of doing some things that you want to change for them? I think everybody's parents could have done a better job. I mean, <laughs> I, 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 I mean, uh, I still can. <laughs> my parents have done, or my parents did at least at the time, everything they thought they could do. You know, they, both my parents worked, um, but they also both provided households. My parents were divorced when I was, I don't know, seven, eight, something like that. Um, but they both always provided, you know, a safe home. They both always provided, you know, food on the table, beds. And, you know, I never had the, the, the struggle of, where is my next meal going to come from or anything like that? There's, looking back, there's things that could have been done better, sure. But at the same time, I, I'm, I didn't have a messed up childhood, yeah. I guess is the way yeah. I would say it. Yeah. Well, I think just generally as we look back, what our, I, I guess my point is the psychology of, I feel like, raising kids is different. It, it's constantly changing. Yeah. I mean, with, I mean, with the integration of, I keep going back to technology, but just how society is constantly changing. Yeah, and, and what we know, right? Like, you mentioned sports. I I played every sport I could play. Um, and, and I would love it if my kids play every sport I could, they could play. But when I was a kid, the idea of a concussion, my, my, my parents would have had no idea if I had a concussion and, and wouldn't have even thought about it. You know, if I fell and I hit my head, they'd understand, hey, he hit his head, but... They, a concussion is not something they they would understand, right? Whereas yeah. now, you know, as my kids start to play sports and, and play football or even just playing outside on their swing set if they fall down, right. knowing the symptoms of a concussion and understanding what it is. So things like that, we know more now. You, yeah. you don't know what you don't know. And, and right. 20 years ago, my parents didn't know things. And, and 30 years ago, 40 years ago, your parents didn't know things that today is common knowledge. But so like seatbelts. Yeah, seatbelts. <laughs> perfect example not sleeping in the back window on a road trip right you those know are all good. or in the back of a truck riding down the road yeah exactly all exactly. those were perfect great examples. yeah great experiences but absolutely apparently they're not safe anymore yeah, yeah. you know it's we joke about it but i I, re I remember being 12 13 years old and, and waking up in the morning getting on my bike and and probably riding my bike 20 miles in a day and being 10, 15 miles from my house on my bike, no cell phone, no nothing. And that was commonplace nowadays. Yeah. And I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm probably just as bad as anyone else. If my kids were like, Hey, I'm going to ride my bike 10 miles away. No, you're not. <laughs> yeah. That's not happening. Are you crazy? Right. But, but you can track them on their phone now. So you well, can hover over them. Right. Well, Sorry. My, mine are still little enough. They don't <laughs> yeah. have phones quite yet. But once they have their phones, you're right. It's, now I have Life 360. I can see exactly where you went. I know exactly what you're doing. And it, it's, yeah, the, the freedom and the, the idea, like I said, just, I, I'd be gone. Come home when the street, when the street lights come on. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Be home for dinner. Okay. <laughs> you know, but yeah. I didn't have the ability, like, to call my parents and tell them I was going to go do something else. I'd have to go to someone's house, hope they were home know where my parents are like yeah <laughs> nowadays yeah. it's one button <laughs> right call mom <laughs> right what uh so lastly this one last thing about if we wrapped all this up and stuff and we, we looked at the military just one last time and stuff anybody that's out there sitting on the fence what would your last thing of encouragement be to either go in or stay out i would say if if you're looking for direction and and you're looking for you know a, a way to advance your life the armed services are great 
because you can go in and and you don't have to take the route that I took where I went in and I did a job in the army and I did that job when I got out and that job has been the stepping stone for the rest of my life. It's been great for me, but you can join the army and do something and get out and do something completely different and you still take the the life skills, the the leadership skills, the social skills, the and, and maybe the on the job training, maybe not, but the, the personal development is is something you don't get in many other places, if anywhere. Um, but again, if, if a rigid schedule and, you know, potentially people kind of, I say picking on you, I, I, you know, you and I are both from backgrounds where we understand people picking on us isn't always a bad thing. You know, there's, there's camaraderie in it. There's, uh, a bond that builds through things like that, that not everybody understands. And if you're not a person who, who can get along in that environment, then maybe the army isn't the best thing for you. Um, but again, I, I'll say for my kids, it's always going to be on the table. I'm, I, I would never be a, a parent who said, Oh no, you, you're not joining the army. Like there's better things for you in life. There's, there's not many better things in life for anyone in reality. There's, the things you can get out of it and the, the advancements it takes you to, you know, unless you're a very extraordinary individual who is going to make, you know, millions and potentially billions of dollars on, on YouTube, on YouTube, <laughs> well, or, or, on, yeah. on whatever music yeah, yeah, or sports yeah. or whatever the case may yeah. be. Um, but you know, if you had to ask me dollar for dollar, should I take right out of high school? Should I take four years and go to a university or should I take four years and go to the army? I'd tell you, you should take four years and go to the army, um, because the university, the education will always be there. The army sort of is, but isn't. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I tried to join after high school and stuff like that. And I didn't really, I could have picked a couple of things I wanted to do and like, nah, I didn't really do that. But when I really found out that I had a passion for medical stuff and tried to get on as a nurse, it's like, sorry, we're not taking anybody at that time. So it was an option. Definitely. I looked at it's a dot option. My brother took, he'd spent 20 years in the air force and, you know, Madison, my middle daughter, she went to the ROTC, mm-hmm. but, and it, it was like, you know, it was good for her. It was just turned out not to be for her. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And well, I and think that's, that's an option that you have. It is. Test and, yourself. and it's, you know, there's always sort of a, a misconstrued what you are, quote unquote, giving up when you join the army, right? Everyone thinks, oh, I'm giving up my life. I'm right. giving up eight years of my life to go do this. Your initial contract is eight years, no matter what. But how many years you actually serve is is variable depending on the job you go into and, and the terms of that contract. The, the eight year thing is you spend whatever portion of that is not active in what they call inactive reserve and very rarely at this point do they call anyone back from the inactive reserve. I mean, it happens, but it's it's not super common, especially now. Um, so like I said, I mean, I did three years. And in those three years, I learned things and, and became a person that I never would have without it. Um, and whether you do four years or, or three years or 24 years, you know, the reality is 20 years is not nearly as long as people think it is. <laughs> You know, especially at 18. At 18, 20 years is longer than you've been alive. Right, and, right. And you, you look at it as such a daunting task. But when you think about the fact that you can be, you can have your first retirement and a, and a every month for the rest of your life paycheck coming in that is going to cover a large portion of your cost of living, you know, regardless of what you're doing, by the time you're 38, how, how is that not a good option for almost everyone, right? Yeah, 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 I agree with you. Well, thank you for being on today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we'll uh, look forward to having you back on. I like to get people back on as time goes on and things change in their life and get their new perspective. For sure. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Enduring the Badge Podcast. I'm your host, Jerry Dean Lund, and I want to personally thank you for listening. Don't forget to rate and review the show wherever you access your podcast. If you know someone that would be great on the show, please get a hold of me at Jerry Fire and Fuel on Instagram, and also you can reach out to me on Enduring the Badge Podcast on Instagram as well. Remember, the views and opinions expressed during the show represent our guests and hosts alone.